So how are we doing? Eight years after his capture as a teenager on an Afghan battlefield, a long-delayed trial began Tuesday for Guantanamo's youngest and last remaining Western detainee. The U.S. Military War Crimes Commission is being held at the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo, somewhere called Camp Justice. But what does it say about justice? Well, here's a hint. On day one, the judge declared that all evidence would be admissible, including that gained through interrogations in Bagram while young Omar Carter was questioned, chained to a stretcher, as well as at Guantanamo. Defense attorneys say he was threatened with rape if he didn't confess. So is that justice? Meanwhile, on another front, Anwar Alaki, a U.S. citizen, is on a U.S. terror list, a target for assassination. The Center for Constitutional Rights is suing to stop it. Executive Director Vince Warren joins me next. It says itself, yeah, I can't move my arm. I requested medical for a long time. They don't do anything about it. No, I mean, they, they look like they're healing well to me. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I think you're getting good medical care. No, I'm not. You're not here. <laughs> I lost my eyes. I lost my feet, everything. No, you still have your eyes, and your feet are still at the end of your legs. Vince, that video from a few years back shows, and people can go back and look at it again on our website, shows this young man in, in, ter in being investigated or being in, interviewed by probably a Red Cross person who's saying, your health care looks fine to me. He's saying, I can't feel my arms, I can't feel my leg, I've lost my feet. No, your leg's right there, your foot's right there. This takes us back, reminds us of this man who, right now, is standing trial in Guantanamo. Fill in some more of the picture of this young guy. Well, Laura, it's a really sad story. It's a sad story with respect to how he's been treated, and it's a sad day for the rule of law. Um, as we know, Omar Khadr is one of the is the only remaining remaining Guantanamo detainee uh, that was a child at the time of his capture. He was r roughly 15 years old. Um, at the time it that he was captured, he was held in Bagram for close to two years. Uh, he was transferred to Guantanamo, where he had to wait to be charged another three years, and he's in his eighth year of detention now. And I think that video really captures, I think, the inhumanity with which um, this person was treated. We have to remember that if the U.S. is saying that this is a battle time decision with respect to him, that he needs to be accorded the rights of, of people in that context. And the other piece that's really important is that he is, by all rights and by definition of international law, a child soldier. No uh, war crimes tribunal has tried a child soldier uh, in the last 40 or 50 years. And you're not just talking about U.S., you're talking anywhere in the world. Is anybody else putting these young people detained at this age on trial? Nobody is. Um, Canada doesn't. Uh, none of the, virtually none of the countries do. And the United States is a complete outlier, yeah. complete outlier in this. Now, let's talk about the dispute. I mean, the U.S. claims he was uh, an enemy combatant, somebody who was caught planting mines with adults. He'd signed up to participate with al-Qaeda. Um, whether his family come from Canada or not, that's where he was on the Afghan battlefield. As you said, others say the guy was 15, something like that, um, a child soldier. Uh, do we have evidence? Do we know the facts? Well, there, there are really two pieces here. And the first piece is what is a 15-year-old like? What, are, what is the story with child soldiers? And the civilized world recognizes that 15-year-olds should not have the same type of responsibility as people that are older. So whatever he was doing, whatever the evidence suggests. Exactly. And typically, um, when you have people that are that young that are in, involved in these type of things, that they're brainwashed, that they're, they're brought around by their parents, they're indoctrinated, and so that, that international law recognizes that they should be treated and their responsibility should be treated than people that are older. The same is with our, our criminal justice system here. So are we going to see with this trial um, the U.S. put on trial? I mean, Omar Khadr has gone from being a young kid, very scared, as in that video, um, to being a pretty defiant guy who's rejected a non-guilty plea and says, I'm going to put the U.S. on trial. But do journalists have access? Do we even know who the prosecutors are? Well, the difficulty here is, well, first of all, I'm glad that you are covering this show because I think a big import of uh, covering this piece, because a big important part of this is to what extent can we put the U.S. on trial in the context of this case. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, his defense team has lost virtually every motion that they've made going back uh, for a number of years, most recently with the court saying that um, all of the evidence against him virtually is going to come in uh, to, to evidence 
evidence, even though some of it was obtained by torture and abuse in two different places. So are we saying it's all right now to interrogate people with threats of rape because whatever comes out of that you can use in a case against them? Laura, we've been talking about this at the Center for Constitutional Rights for so long. Let me be clear. We are not saying that it's okay. And I, and I know the defense is not saying that it's okay either. The problem is, is that the Obama administration, by putting forth these, uh, putting forth this evidence, by even having this military commission trial, this is Obama's first military commission trial, is effectively saying it doesn't matter if we torture it out of you. It doesn't matter if you were 15 years old. The uh, international conventions on the rights of the child and civil political rights really don't matter to us. All that matters is that we have a political conviction. So why bother to have elections? Now it's not just Obama's war, but Obama's war on terror. And if anything, people's hopes are double dashed that this can be changed through voting. I think it's, it's double dashed and I think it goes much deeper because when President Obama, before he was president, was talking very specifically about moving us closer to the rule of law, rejected specifically the idea of military commissions, and he is the first person to try a child soldier in an international uh, tribunal that is rigged from the beginning. So let's go to another case, and you brought a lawsuit around that this month, and that's the case of Anwar Awlaki, which also shines a miserable light on the U.S. administration right now. Here's a quick story from CNN about this case, which has to do with U.S. targeted assassination of terror targets, in this case, a U.S. citizen. The government alleges that Al-Awlaki, a U.S. citizen now believed to be in Yemen, communicated with the Fort Hood shooter and aided the unsuccessful underwear bomber. The U.S. government has never explicitly acknowledged that he is targeted for assassination, but read between the lines. Individuals shouldn't be able to hide behind their U.S. passport, their U.S. citizenship. That if they present a threat and challenge to us, we need to make sure that we're able to address that threat. This is a war. The citizenship of the individual is irrelevant. What is relevant is whether or not this individual is an enemy combatant that can be lawfully attacked with deadly force. Vince, the significance of this case and your suit against it? The significance is that the Obama administration has now put someone on the targeted assassination list who is a U.S. citizen who is allegedly hiding in Yemen, which is close to 1,500 miles away from any recognized battlefield. And if the U.S. is now giving the order to assassinate U.S. citizens far from the battlefield, the game is over. That gives the U.S. the, the uh, they were claiming the power of judge, jury, and executioner. And there is literally nothing to stop them from targeting people from, for assassination in any country that they, que that they choose with the rhetoric that we heard from Lawrence Rifkin, which is, we just declare that these people are enemy combatants, and we don't need courts of law to, to, to uh, figure these things out. Final thought. I mean, has the summer become our kind of war crime season? I mean, summer after summer. I'm about to take a break for a week. Every vacation I've had for the last few years, it seems to me, during that period where people aren't paying attention, we see expansion of war, uh, of wiretapping, expansion of spying, and this kind of case go down to almost no attention. The, we are in for a, a longer season than I think we would want. The presidential powers, even under this administration, are expanding. Organizations like the Center for Constitutional Rights and the ACLU that's doing the case with us um, are accused of, of representing people that are, that are terrorists. But the issue is that the U.S. is now in the business of assassinating its own citizens, and they need to be stopped. Vince Warren, thanks so much for joining us. You'll be back again soon, I'm sure. Vince Warren is the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. There's more information through the links at our website.